Hello, everybody. Is there anybody there? Is there anybody there? All right, so we're big, we're bad, and we're back. I see we have Anita, who says we're 735 subscribers away from 200,000. Hello, Ralph. Hello, Alexi. Uh, please tell us what plugins are best for mixing electric and acoustic guitars. We will do. Tika says, what's up, people? What's up? Storm Shadow says, hi, all. Uh, Wave says, Anita. I am Andy. Hello. Um, so. Eddie's early. Hello, rainy Jer in rainy Jersey. Oh, Portugal. Oh, Vic. Hello in Wolverhampton. Thank you, Glenn. I didn't get to play guitar much yesterday. I was, uh, I was working over a harmony. In the mixer here. I'm sure many of you follow In The Mix. If you don't already, go do it. Hey, In The Mix. Michael, I'd love to do some more stuff with you. Let's talk. I know we, uh, I, I, I know I sort of like half asked an idea before, but let's do something really great together. You're like one of my favorite channels. Ron, I worked on How To Save A Life and uh, the second Frey album, which was called The Frey. Uh, those are the two Frey albums I did. Oh, and I also um, recorded a lot of the stuff for the third album. They took all the demos that I did and used them and added some stuff to it. They didn't give me production credit, but hey, that's the way it is. Uh, Luton, hello in Yorkshire. Hello in Sun Valley. Hello in Israel. Beautiful. And uh, Philly, Mexico, in the Bronx. Hello, nothing's nothing. Can you tell me the best VST guitar for free? I'm not sure what the best free one is. Um, you got the MV2, yes. I'm sure um, young Matt is going to uh, put the MV2 up and put a link to it because it's, uh, it's a plugin we love. Um, hello in Brazil, beautiful. Hello in Croatia, Norway. Yeah, uh, the K340s you've had modified from the 70s, great. How do you record the Matthews acoustic guitar? It sounds amazing. Well, thank you. How did I record them? It was this guitar. So that's a big start. It's a Yamaha. Uh, you see it? LL16. So it was this and a combination of... Oh, Max has it. The Max Matthews guitar player has it, uh, and my 70s uh, Yamaha. Do you remember what that model is? I can't remember what it is. It's not very expensive. What about banjo? I record banjo all the time. I record it with a small diaphragm condenser. Sometimes I've recorded with 57 and it sounds great. Hello there in Greece. You know, I'm a big fan. Hello, Martin. Martin Larson. Oh, hello in Vienna. Oh, what a beautiful part of the world. More people from Greece. I, I think you all know I'm a, Greek, I'm a fan of Greece and the Greek <laughs> and the Greeks. Uh, lots of people from Greece. Um, Vietnam, beautiful. California. Malcolm's on the East Coast. The MV2 for my alarm clock. Yeah, what I do is I'll set the low and the high and then I take the output gain and make it get louder and louder to wake me up. Uh, how to mix a 12 string that don't dominate the mix. Okay. Hello, Chris in New Mexico. Chicago. Good morning, Marvin. Any updates? Um, yeah, we're, we're in the middle of it, Jeff. We're in the middle of it. Kentucky. Hello, Broadway Joe. Hey, Joe. How are you? Budapest. One who else aside from Gretsch makes a small body short. Um, I, I, there's a lot of people make, I, I need to get a decent jazz guitar. I don't actually have one. I have that uh, Vox over there, the Typhoon, and it's okay, but it's not as good as I want. Um, I don't have a red special, can you believe it? I really want one, but I don't have one. 
Yep, Paul Lucas. LCT 140. That's what I used on a lot of the Matthews stuff. And occasionally I'll use um, a 57. Occasionally. Believe it or not, I use a 57 on acoustics as well. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get stuck into it. I'm going to put this down. I'm going to grab this trusty Revstar because I have to noodle and I have to play guitar while I'm talking because that's just who I am. I'm going to bring up my chair so you guys can see the guitar I'm using because a lot of people, they ask me what it is because it's out of shot. And let's get stuck into guitars. Why don't we start with acoustics? Um, so there's a couple of things. Would you mind, young Andrew, grabbing me an LCT 140? Because uh, as Paul mentioned, oh, you ha you own that Pacifica uh, 921. It's great, isn't it, for shredding? Hello in Finland. Hello, Paul, back in Ohio. I don't use mid-side recording on guitars. Say that 540? No, the 140. 140. Just a small diaphragm. Okay, so here it is. So, LL16. This was the guitar I just got asked about what we used on the Matthews record. This is what we used, and we'll use it more. We also used my old, um, we also used my old acoustic as well. <laughs> I think we have uh, I think we have Christian Vey standing outside the door wishing to come in. And Christian Vey is coming in. Hey Christian, you're you're live on YouTube. Hi everyone. Hello there in Rome. Hello in New York. Hello in Florida. Hi in Northern Ireland. Beautiful. Hello Craig in New York. Colombia. Scottish borders. Why no mid-side? I, I don't really get how it would work in a mix for me. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I, it's tough. I don't really understand, for me, for things that play with the phase don't make sense to me. Because when I'm standing in a room, this is how I hear. You know what I mean? I, I don't hear manipulated and... and uh, how are they in Ilford? Um, and so for me, I want to hear, I, I don't want to hear things that are quite so manipulated. And I get really disconcerted when I hear stuff that's sort of like cancelling out the middle to create width. Um, I will use MS Techniques occasionally, and I will use widening plugins, but I usually use them on pads that I'm just trying to throw out a little bit and create some space for the middle. <laughs> It's tough. I'm not a big fan of it. Most of the records I love weren't weren't manipulated that way. Um, and also for me, an acoustic guitar, unless you've got your head here, you're only going to hear a direct sound of it. Do you know what I mean? So I want. You know what I mean? I don't. It's there's some nice techniques, but ultimately not big on the MS thing. So. When they can bring me a, can you bring me a small diaphragm then, if you can't find a 140? Just unplug one from the overhead, can you bring it to me? Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, so, here's the acoustic guitar. Now you've seen videos of me talking about this and somebody already mentioned. So one of my favorite places is here. So let's sort of do this. I have to move the chat out of the way so I can see what you guys are seeing. Okay, so here. So it's at the body, you see? See here? So imagine that's at the body here. The angle would be like this. Does that make sense? But pulled back. Okay, so imagine you're on the lower part of the body here. So about here, in the middle of the horn down here, whatever you want to call it then the angle is angled away from the sound hole and pulled back. Does that make sense? I'm going to turn this around, see? Like this. Now I'm going to bring it like this. Does that make sense? I'm trying to show every angle here possible. And this is a very inexpensive Lewitt microphone. You can use this, highly recommend it. I'm, if you're an Academy member, you can buy these at nearly 65% off because we have um, an educational discount. 
So those of you in the academy, you can get these for peanuts. They're ridiculously good and very inexpensive. I used this on Aerosmith's record. I didn't use it on the Frey record because they hadn't made them then. It's too new a company. But I used them on Aerosmith and I used them it was when they were brand spanking new and just come out. And I've used them on everything, Aces Records, the Matthews. This is the secret weapon. It's really inexpensive. Sometimes when I want a big, fat, low midly, gunkier, but still sparkling top, I'll probably use a really expensive mic, which is a KM56, which the Beatles used, the Neumann. But the other thing, can you hand me a large diaphragm condenser? But... But the other thing that I like to do when I'm going for a pop one, oh, and by the way, you can do the same trick that we're talking about here with a 57. Try it with a 57. You know what I mean? You can do that with a 57. But just give me any large diaphragm condenser, please. Hello? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. All right, so what do we have here? Five, oh, 640. So we have the 640 TS. Those of you that know this microphone, and you know, I've also got um, Roswell mics that we love. You know, I, I, you know me. I mean, it's like we're moving between two crazy things here: very expensive stuff and very affordable stuff. You know, to me, it's like it's got to be the best, or it's got to be something which is the best because it's incredible value for money. So anyway, let's I'll, I'll explain more about that in a second. So let's take this and then show you the pop place. This is the classic pop acoustic guitar miking. So what it is, is it's even, so imagine 12th to 14th fret, this area here, 12th to 14th fret, and go, so you see my fingers are here, 12th, 14th fret. Lay the capsule dead center on the string so it's even. Does that make sense like this? And then bring it back out. I'm going to twist around so you can see that. Does that make sense? So what it is, it is on the 12th to 14th fret. It's even, meaning it's covering the strings perfectly like this, but it's pulled back. That will give you your lovely, scoopy, pop acoustic guitar sound. And there's certain guitars I use for that. All right, we have a great question here from Central Oregon Recording. Do you find recording a normal and acoustic and a high-strung guitar is easier to fix in a mix than a 12-string? Yes, yes, and yes. Thank you for answering, answering that que asking that question. So, as you know, I use the, the high string technique all the time. As a musician and an engineer and a producer and a mixer and all that kind of stuff, primarily as a musician, I was blessed to work with some of the greatest producers and engineers in the world. And one of those experiences was working with, can you close the door, you guys are talking. Um, one of those, um, one of those great experiences was working with Don Smith. And Don Smith did all of the um, all of the big like mid 80s through to early 90s Tom Petty. So when you think of, you know, you know, good half, da, 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 that's him. So I did a record with him in 95 and we were doing guitar overdubs. I was a guitar player. And we were doing like this kind of like, you know. And I was like, oh, I want that Tom Petty, tw Tom Petty 12 string. And he looked at me and went, what do you mean? I was like, you know, the Rickenbacker, the 12 string acoustic. It was primarily electric guitar I was talking about at the time. And he's like, we don't use 12 strings. And I was like, what do you mean? And that's when he showed me what he called in 95, the Nashville tuning. A couple of disclaimers. Don Smith, unfortunately, died a few years ago. Don Smith was one of the best engineers that ever lived. If he was still alive, I'd be interviewing him every other day. He's phenomenal. Go and check out everything he did with Tom Petty. Go and check out all of the Don Was records that he engineered. Go and check out, uh, remember that song, I touch myself, I want you to love me. He recorded and mixed that. It's phenomenal mix, phenomenal. Go check out Free Falling and all that stuff. Most of all, for those of you who are huge fans of all the obvious bands, check out the Traveling Wilburys. He recorded and mixed that too. The guy is phenomenal. Oh. 
and all of the Keith Richards solo stuff, all the expensive winos. That's him recording and mixing with Steve Jordan playing drums. So when this guy tells you tricks about how to record, and he's talking about recording George Harrison and Bob Dylan and Roy Orbison and Tom Petty, you listen. So this is how he did it. So what he did is he just recorded it like this, and then he grabbed, it could be completely out of tune, which I'm sure it is, a, and it doesn't matter if it's cheap. This is very cheap. I found this in a skip. This was in a skip, and we had to change the machine heads on it because one of them was missing and one of them was broken. Can't tell which one. Don't remember which two. And close enough for jazz, not quite in tune. We didn't think about it before. My fault. But so what's special about this? Well, we call this Nashville tuning. In Nashville, I hear it's called high string. I suppose that makes sense. They wouldn't call it our tuning. Maybe they do. So what is it? It's the high strings of a 12 string. What does that mean? That means regular E, regular B, octave G, octave D, octave A, octave E. So you get... So just double that with your high strung and you've got the best 12 string acoustic guitar sound you've ever got. And again, record it here. See the tip? So get centered on here, like this, pull back maybe four or five inches and then tilt away from the sound hole. Does that make sense? Like that. That will give you, a, it's really, really good for this kind of stuff. Because it picks up this. All right, another story. When I was, uh, when I was a kid, um, like teenager, like proper kid, I worked in music stores. Um, you know, I was playing in bands and working in music stores. Many of us have that same story. You know, you, you have Saturday jobs or you work in music stores. As you know, I worked at Anderton's for a while with Lee Anderton. I also worked at Kingfisher in, 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 uh, in my hometown, or my, the nearest town to my village. And uh, both great, great stores. Kingfisher, unfortunately, is no longer there. And Anderton's is going from strength to strength. As you know, Lee's doing amazing things there. And um, we we would have different players come in. In those days at Kingfisher, Colin Fisher, who ran the place, was a real aficionado of acoustics. I don't know if he... I don't know if he would admit that or, or be cognizant of it, but essentially he had one of the best collections of new acoustic guitars that you could see. And he had a lot of Martins, and he also had a lot. At that time, when I was working there, I was 16 years old, he, he had a lot of really beautiful classical guitars. Flash forward, John Williams comes into the store. John Williams, the John Williams. So I'm like this kid, like... And we had Brian May come in, we had John Deacon come in. We, I remember Gary Newman bought synths. He pulled up in a Ferrari and sent a girl in to pick up the synth. It's all very strange. This was this was a long time ago. Anyway, so very but very eclectic. John Deacon came in. I remember asking his son, who was probably my age or a little younger than me, whether he was going to be a bass player like his dad. And his son said, "No, I want to be a drummer." <laughs> but anyway, so all these different guys would come in. But John Williams was pretty hardcore. So John Williams comes in, and he picks up acoustics off of the wall, classical guitars, like you would. I mean, uh, you know, somebody was helping him. And he did this, picked them up and went, held them and went like this, tap the top and then put them back on the wall and pick up another one, tap the top, put it back on the wall, pick up another one, tap the top. And then he got one that was just live enough for him, that sounded like just enough, live enough. And then he would sit down and, you know, 
suddenly play the most beautiful classical guitar you've ever heard in your life. Arguably the most beautiful guitar you've ever heard in your life. Classical guitar you've ever heard in your life. I, I can't really dispute that. And, but his selection process was whether the top was live. I don't know exactly what he was listening for, but he made me very conscious, especially with that BBC recording trick, which I've known for 30 or 40 years of my life, this particular BBC recording trick, um, that makes sense. And especially when you think of classical, because yes, there's some... There's definitely chordal work in classical, but it's at a minimum compared with rock and roll. Most of it is, you know, you know, most of it is plucked and it's the right hand technique. So he was listening for something that was very responsive, very percussive. And so it all makes sense to me, that miking of the body, that idea that this top would be light enough to be resonant and percussive. You know, and then if it was, and then it had the body when he was playing it, it was the perfect guitar. So, but remember, once again, we'll reiterate, for the pop one, and when you want a big smiley face pop acoustic, 12 to 14 fret here. So that's the area, so the capsule's over it, and bring it back. You know, you can come back quite far, but, be rem but remember, here's about right, about four or five inches. The more you get back, the more you're going to get, like... The potential of a lot of woofiness from the sound hole. You know, I'm a, 12 to 14th is good about there for me, but if I start moving over here, I'm going to get this woof here. Now, don't get me wrong, you can EQ that out somewhat, but you're going to get a huge build up. When I was working with Paul Gilbert and he was doing like, you know, he's an amazing guitar player, as you know, he was really aggressive, really, really aggressive in his EQ on the low end. Unbelievably so. I saw him go up to about 150 or 140. I can't remember, was it 140 or 150? And high pass it. Now, don't get me wrong, it wasn't like a, a super aggressive remove everything from 150 and below, but it's where his shelf started. And so he took quite a lot out. Now, bear in mind, he's a rock player, and even when he's doing like his. <laughs> the super fast stuff, and he's a really articulate player. I mean, one of the best guitar players ever work with um, but you know he's he's recording inside of dense music he's gonna have electric guitars he's gonna have bass guitar he's gonna have kick or whatever but a lot of like chug and stuff you know going on um, so he was quite aggressive on it now so getting back to that great question yes so that's the answer yes I do if I want a 12 uh, oh you're in Basingstoke how old are you with filthy Phil were you Oh, when did you go there? Hey, Stephen. You're not late, it's okay. Um, oh, the cell sets, cell sets for high strung, that must be a new thing over the last few years of us all talking about it, you know? Um, um, anyway, so I'll talk about not recording nine, nine wrong guitars in a minute. Uh, it's, a diff it's a kind of different, that's a good question. I will come to that in a, it, it, it comes to that in a second. But anyway. So, so covering that 12 string situation, now the same thing, I know you were asking about acoustic guitars there, but also the same thing is you can do that also with electrics. And the classic, Don told me that the classic Tom Petty electric um, 12 string sound was two Telecasters. One high strung and one regular strung. That's the classic, you know. <laughs> When you hear all that in a 12 string, it's actually two telecasts. And look, it makes sense. It's really tough on a 12 string, unless, and if you've got a 12 string Rickenbacker, those, and I've had one at one stage, I sold it, but when I had it, the best way to articulate was to always play like this, down, down, down. Because you're playing down and you're hitting both strings evenly. As soon as you get... You know, you're so used to picking up like this, which is great. You know, but you're not guaranteed that you're going to hit both of those strings at once. So, you, I tend to do this. And that sounds really good. So if you are recording a 12 string acoustic, of which I have a cheap but good one over here. It's really cheap and probably completely out of tune. Out 
totally out of tune, but you'll notice all down strokes. And you hear both strings. Now, that's up and down. You hear it's not that as even. It's just that there's, it, it, there's just something with that articulation. As soon as you move to the up and down, even with an angled pick, once you've got two strings, you're not guaranteed you're going to hit them exactly the same way because you're coming across as an angle. And so that second string, wherever it might be on the, on the up, gets ignored as much as the down. But there's a deliberateness with, with that down stroke. So if you are recording a 12 string and you want to do that famous bad... You know, Badly played, but the way to do it is all da 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 all down strokes, down strokes really articulated well, which is a good thing anyway. You should be working on the articulation. You know, having great technique is fantastic, don't get me wrong, but sometimes employing one kind of stroke just the same way, just for one second, we'll get onto it like bass players, all the great guys, James Jameson. Sean Hurley, for instance, who plays with Mayer. I know, uh, I, I know he's not with Mayer at the moment, but he's... Who is he out with at the moment? But anyway, he plays with everybody. He's one of the top session players in L.A. He can play super articulate with two or three fingers. However, 99% of the time when he's tracking and it's just... He's using one finger. He's using one finger because you get this... You get that even... As soon as you get... You get anya, 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 two different things. Doesn't matter what you do with this. Tell you how As soon as you start getting the up and downs, it's, it's never going to be as even as one complete stroke. That's why all the great session players, they, they, they're not trying to show their amazing technique, they're trying to get great results. And it's quite deliberate. And, and you listen, you watch guys like Tim Pierce play, it's very, very deliberate. It's very articulated. It's about getting a great recording. It's not about like, hey, look at me, I did this. You know. Anyway, that's a whole other five hour discussion. We're starting to add up our acoustics here. Um, and uh, so let me quickly reiterate. I know it's the third time, but okay. Here's your tip. Small diaphragm. I'm using a Lewitt, an inexpensive Lewitt. This is where it should be placed, okay? Pull it back about four or five inches and then point it up away from the sound hole. Does that make sense? Can you go see that? Okay, that will give you 90% of the situations. You want perfect pop acoustic guitar, 12th to 14th fret. Make sure the diaphragm is exactly level with all of the strings. If you want more bass, go up. If you want more treble, you go down. But I go even, 12th to 14th fret, and then bring it back again the same. Probably a little further back, but if you come too far back, you're going to start picking up too much um, sound hole. If that's what happens, and sometimes you have to come back because the guitar player, he or she, moves around a lot. So when you have to do that to get an even sound, point it a little bit at an angle. You see what I'm doing? I'm pointing a little bit of an angle, so it points more towards the strings and away from the sound hole. So that's our little refresher on acoustic guitars. The other thing about acoustic guitars, and we'll talk about it for a second, is mixing. When you're mixing acoustic guitars, you have to decide what is their purpose in your mix. I use acoustic guitars in rock all the time. Sometimes some super heavy rock stuff has, uh, has acoustics. Um, and we'll get on to double micing in a minute, and we'll get, on to, um, we'll get on to double micing, and we'll also get on to classicals in a minute. Um, the um, you have to decide with rock and roll acoustic guitars is what is it there for? What are you doing? If it's if it's literally singer songwriter, then um, and it's predominantly the guitar in the mix, I'll probably pull back in an ideal situation and use a little bit more of the room. So when I did some acoustic stuff with, um, I did an acoustic EP with the Fray like 10 years ago in Blackbird in Nashville. And what I did is they had this little room that was kind of, was pretty live and I just pulled back the mic 
about this far back from the acoustic and the vocal mic quite a, quite a long way back and I picked up a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit of the room ambience because that was all that I needed. I didn't want to record a super dry, super up front acoustic, super up uh, vocal, sorry, super up front acoustic, and then smother a bunch of reverb on it to try and make it sound like it was in a room. Why not just record it in a room? And because it was done live, there wasn't much I could do. It wasn't like I was going to suddenly tune the vocal. If you've got a lot of acoustic guitar bleed into a vocal mic, you cannot tune the vocal. And even if you do, you'll hear this as, as the, the acoustic guitar gets pulled up with the vocal because there's bleed in the vocal mic. It's very logical stuff. I mean, in general, logic pervades when it comes to recording and mixing. So, um, so a lot of the answers to the questions that are coming in here, in here are what are you trying to achieve? Now, when it comes to rock, I will always record one mic. And I'll always record one mic because I'm trying to make the acoustic serve a purpose. Let's just say I have, um, you know, guitars like... Let's distort it down, 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 down. I'll double that with an acoustic, you know, but I'm going to play it. I'm going to record it with one mic. It's probably going to be here. Um, it might be in a more pop situation. But what is it, what am I using it for? Well, I'm using it to add a little bit of air, like a little... I want to hear... I'm not... I'm not doing it to add some girth, because I got an electric guitar going. Now that's, that's chugging along, that's got a bunch of distortion. So what is my acoustic guitar serving? It's serving some air. So I'll probably record it, well, either down there or on the 12th to 14th, but its purpose is going to be about high end. However, acoustics, and I know a lot of you know this, when, especially when played hard, can tend to fret out. They can get a little buzzy. You know, you get that sitari kind of sound on acoustic. So one of the tricks to do that is to boost the high end the way you want it, but to use DSs. DSs will calm the high end. So you boost the high end, roll off the low end, high pass the low end, boost the high end, but put DSs on it, and then you'll get gentle compression of those high frequencies that are really bothering you. And then you can blend them back into those electrics, and it gives you another level of percussion. I've done stuff with Mark Endo mixing, and he's taken like an acoustic, which was like a, and it's just it's ended up sounding like just almost just all this, but he's blended it with my electric guitars and my keys and stuff, and it adds a and it's almost like there's a, a, a shaker that's playing harmony and melody, you know, so you got so these are, and it's controlled with the DSs, so it doesn't sound like high end popping in and out. Nicely controlled. So for me, the answer to these questions about single mics or double miking is what is it for? So, classical guitars and double miking. Classical, classical guitars are very much falling into that, that, what I just talked about, like if it's performance based, single classical guitar, you want the sound of the classical guitar as you hear it in the room. So first of all, get into a good room. If the room sucks and it's got tons of standing waves and the acoustic sounds awful, try dampening it down and making it get rid of the unevenness. And then you can get with a closer mic and use some reverb to make it feel like it's in a room. But if you are lucky enough to be in a good room, stereo miking is okay. But I wouldn't do a stereo miking like one here and one there. I would literally just do an XY or a bloom line. So either a bloom line like this or an XY and I would pull it back. So like, you know, if, the, if this is a classical, mic's about this far away. Just pull it back and get the sound of a human being. Because when you go to see somebody like Julian Bream or John Williams playing, you know, the great classical guitar players, when they're playing, you want, you're hearing them in a room and they are playing to the room. Remember, these are great performers. Just like Jimi Hendrix was an incredible performer with a Strat in front of a Marshall and he knew how to catch that feedback, it's the extra level of performance which goes beyond just technique and all that stuff, when, when it's, it really is feel and emotion. Just like Jimi Hendrix was doing that with a Marshall and a Strat, Julian Bream or John Williams are doing that with the classical guitar in the room. 
they are feeding off the sound. They're playing harder or softer for the ambience, for that reverberation, whatever you want to call it. This is what great artists do. That's like when you see a piano player, a classical piano player. They do play, they play to the piano. There's an action that each piano has and has a different feel. They're hitting harder or softer depending on all of these different things. That's the beauty of this stuff. So, with that in mind, when you're recording things like classical instruments, you have to be aware of that. If you're in a really crappy room, then deaden it out and you're gonna to have to add the ambience. But if you're fortunate enough to have a good sounding room and it's the only instrument being featured, you can stereo mic and my best my best answer to your question about classical guitar recording and with double miking is like if it's that situation then go into the room and walk around while the player is playing and find where it sounds the best and guess what put the mics there if it, you're six feet away from the classical guitar player and you're kneeling down and you hear it and you hear a bit of room and it sounds fantastic put the microphones there put a balloon line like this or put an XY like this where it sounds the best. That's your answer. Because we have this thing where we think close miking is always the answer. It can be the answer. But a lot of what we love and a lot of the guitar tones and a lot of everything um, is where we're going. Uh, for classical guitar, would, have, would voice, would two different reverbs work or under the same? I'd probably go with one but maybe I would add like a tiny bit of delay to the vocal. The experiments like tiny amounts, just something. But you're right, sometimes it's best to go with one reverb or sometimes I've got away with short room, like tiled room, quiet tiled room on a guitar and then bigger, longer, not massively long, but longer reverbs on the vocals, more ambient. That can work. So I've got a shorter tiled room on the guitars, on the classical, on the acoustic and the, the, the maybe it's over a second on the vocal, but it's not very loud, you know. <laughs> I love your haircut. <laughs> this model uh, is a rev star. Okay, so we've done acoustics, we've done classicals, we've done double miking when I use it and when I don't use it. Um, that's quite a lot. I think for things like mandolins and um, uh, banjos, um, I actually moved between small diaphragm condensers and 57s. I found 57 is quite a nice little mic for lots of situations. And if you happen to have a decent sized budget, like a lot of money to spend on a mic, then the original KM series and the um, and then the 50s and 60s and the new ones as well, the Gefells are an amazing way to go because the tube versions of Neumanns and Gefells like the, five, you know, the 582, you know that one? That's the um, Gefell 582 or the KM 53, 54, and 56. And we're talking those of you that have a large amount of money to spend. So they're very expensive, especially the Neumanns. They are amazing on very small body. Okay, we need to do a giveaway. And Matt is going, giveaway, giveaway, giveaway. Okay, so... What is your favorite acoustic guitar brand? Now what we're gonna do is you're gonna win all of the Phil Allen courses. Phil Allen was my old engineer who recorded Adele, Someone Like You, won a Grammy for it, has engineered a whole bunch of stuff for me, was my co-writer on some songs, co-producer on stuff. He's absolutely phenomenal. Um, so you can win his full production course where he records acoustic guitars and electric guitars and it's, absolutely amazing and also the mix course that comes with it so what is your a favorite acoustic guitar brand it can be classical as well you could say Alvarez you could say Yamaha what is your favorite one and um, if you haven't recorded it just say I haven't recorded acoustic guitar because that's okay I want everybody to, to be able to enter this if you don't have a brand just say I'm not sure or whatever so you can but I'd love to know what are your favorite. Lots of Taylors, lots of Yamahas, nice to see. Martins, of course, Gibsons, Schechter, Sigma. Sigma are great. Faith, Ibanez, Encore, Guild. I, I'm a big Guild fan. Uh, Gibson, Taylor, 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 Breedlove, Martin, Tanglewood, Yamaha, Yamaha, Taylor, Gibson, Tanglewood, Fender, Martin, uh, Tower's not sure. 
uh, Yamaha Takamine, uh, Feld, uh, Gibson, Taylor, Takamine, Yamaha, Faith. I don't know the Faith yet. I see that. Gibson, Martin. You haven't recorded one. That's okay. Um, Martin. Well, you haven't recorded one, but I understand. Gibson, Hummingbird, Jasmine, uh, Fuchs, Fender, Hondo, Goda. Great selections. Some f uh, Good to see some... Uh, uh, Yamahas and some cheap offenders and some guilds. Collings, that's beautiful. Seagulls, there's some good. Oh, Laravie, very great, great guitars. Ovation, Taylor. Uh, Alvarez, Martin, Lavery, Godin. Mar uh, some really, uh, Goda are very. Uh, Washburn, that's a nice one, yeah. I, I grew up, when I grew up, Washburn was the affordable guitars with Yamaha. Um, Epiphones, uh, loads of great, great ones. Cigar box guitar, yes. Guild. Terry says Guild 12 string. Boucher or Boucher, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, sorry. Uh, Czech brand, can't remember the name. Mike Michaels, would you, hey! So you won the two courses, the production and the mix course. Fantastic. So Mike, just uh, uh, email, email Matt and he will get that to you. Absolutely wonderful. Okay, so we've done a lot of that. We've done a lot of acoustic guitar stuff, and we've talked a bit about the EQ and about using DS. It's a big, big deal. So let's um, let's talk about electric guitars. And just so you know, we are going to get into amp sims. We're going to do a lot of discussion about amp sims. Not today, but it's coming. It is coming. So stay tuned. Oh, and by the way, if you haven't already, please like and share. That would be absolutely amazing. Um, you know, having people uh, join us and the way that YouTube um, promotes us and lets us lets other people know that we're online at the moment is when it's liked and shared. Um, so I'm sorry. I think somebody told me I'm too salesy to do it, but uh, I'm I'm looking at here. Let's have a quick look. Mixing electric. There's 367 people watching. Thank you ever so much all over the world. 147 people liking. Two people disliking already. There you go. <laughs> Two people don't like free content. Don't like us helping them out. Um, that's quite all right. So with the 369 people watching, would you please like and share it? That would be absolutely amazing. It's fantastic. So let's get into electric guitars. Um, we've talked about electric guitars a lot recently. So that's the reason why I wanted to start off with the acoustics and the mandolin and the banjos. Um, and remember, before we move on, remember a 57 on an acoustic guitar was Mark Endert's favorite guitar sound I recorded for him. He called me up and said, this sounds amazing, how'd you do it, a 57, and he said, I know I've said this a lot, but he said, um, I'm not surprised when I said it was only a 57. So remember that. So don't feel like you have to have the $10,000 KM series or $5,000 KM series. Okay, so electric guitars. Let's talk a little bit about the recording, because we always do, and then let's talk about the mixing. Now, there's two points I want to make about the mixing, so I'm going to get to there pretty quickly. Now, number one with the with electric guitars, we've all we've talked about um, 57's front um, on uh, front-facing cabs only. We've also talked about when you have an open back using a 57 mirroring the front. So if you've got a 57 here and another one there, this one's like flipped to the polarity. So no matter where it's facing, we try to get them as opposite each other as each other with one of them flipped. So if you've got one at a cone like this on the front, then the back one should come in pretty opposite, as near as you can, and that will give you the best polarity. And then you take this back one and you flip it opposite this one. And as the speakers move in this direction or that direction, you get the theory, the phase, the polarity remains constant. So the back one is always flipped the other way. Somebody asked me about this and said that I was talking about Alice in Chains and Dave Jordan recording that way. And then they said that they had read that uh, Jerry Cantrell said that that's how he likes to record guitars. Which of course is because he did uh, three albums with Dave. And of course those were the albums, the, the big albums like Man in the Box, Dirt obviously and all that stuff. Those were all done with Dave and that's how Dave records acoustics. I think he started doing that with... Um, I can't remember where he did it. Maybe it was with Eno in Remain in the Light. It was definitely on some others. Um, um, all right, Diego's come up with a great question there. Says, thanks for all the great Q&As. What do you think of the of ISO cabs? Pretty spectacular. 
Um, I don't have ISO caps. We have a live room. Um, but I can tell you people that do. Tim Pierce has ISO cabs built into his garage underneath his studio, which is above it. Bob Marlette has a separate, like, outbuilding, and he has ISO cabs built in there. So lots of people have them. They have these ISO um, rooms, and it's a really, really good idea. And for really huge rock guitars in particular, when you want super dead, very controlled environments, these work really, really well because they're basically a microphone on a speaker in a very dead, usually firm, sorry, foam built box that has a door on it with foam in it and you close it in and you just play some rock guitar and it sounds in your face, dry as a bone, no ambience, no reflections, nada, and just dead and fantastic. So what do I think of it? If you have uh, a situation like I actually have a building behind the house here which we could do that in a small shed but we use it for storage but we could put a plate in there I thought about doing it before if we had extra storage I could put a plate in there and I could also put a storage room in there I mean uh, um, an ISO room in there and put like some 412s you know and we were talking about with um, Dave Jordan has 412 cabs with multiple speakers and different makes of speakers in there Bulldogs Blue Bulldog you know from a Vox Vintage 25, Vintage 30, and I think an Eminence, I don't remember now, but four different speakers, four mics on it, and then he chooses, either blends or chooses which one he wants with an amp. Great idea. So you could have that. You could get yourself a Marshall 412, put four different speakers in there, mic them all with 57s, and have them come up, have them in an ISO booth and have them come up on your console, or whatever coming up in your DAW with four different inputs. You swap over the amps to all of these different inputs, and it's remarkable what you can get. So it's a good idea if you've got the space and you want it. Now, it's not going to give you what I was about to talk about because we did the 57s and we talked about, you know, different mics using 421s, about 609s and Sennheisers. It's not going to give you that. Thank you, Bill. It's not going to give you that amp in the room sound. Now, yesterday, after I finished my session, um, or as I was finishing it, I was hanging out with Matt, who was assisting us, and he played me a mix he was working on, and it sounded like punk rock meets ACDC. So I said to him, do you know Highway to Hell? And he didn't know the album Highway to Hell. And I said, go listen to Shot Down in Flames. So there you go, do this, do this for me. And everybody who wants to talk about electric guitar tones, go and open up, you know, make a note of it, go and listen to ACDC, Highway to Hell. I actually think that's their masterpiece album. It's the first one with Mutt Lang before Back in Black, and I believe it is a masterpiece. But listen specifically to the guitar tones. Listen to Shot Down in Flames and hear the room in the guitar tone. Now, to me, it's very controlled. What does that mean? It means that it's mic'd directly with a room tone blended together it is a phenomenal phenomenal sound and even now it sounds fresh and exciting getting back to so okay so we're talking so listen to that it's probably like an 87 in a room blended with that amp mic so go and listen to that shot down in flames or the whole of highway to hell to listen to some of these tones somebody last week asked me about drum tones and how to get acdc well, how about how to get guitar tones like that? So I have two things I want to talk about with mixing electric guitars, which I'm going to get to in two seconds. But let's do another giveaway. So we're going to do two Phil Allen courses on production and one is on mixing. Phil is my old engineer, a very good friend. He's actually my daughter's godfather. That's how close we are. And, um, and a wonderful, wonderful guy. Won a Grammy for recording Someone Like You by Adele, which I believe is the biggest selling single of the last... 20 years so he's pretty talented and a wonderful guy so the courses are really good it's got a full Phil Allen production course where he produces a song from scratch you see pre-production the whole process of recording and then there's a mix course mixing the song in the box and it is really 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 good stuff okay so first of all would you like and share I see that there are 367 people watching thank you 240 likes please let's get that up to over 367 likes okay um so oh matt wants me to mention this sorry matt 
We are doing a live webinar with Bobby Alsinski on June the 6th at 4, June the 6th at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Live webinar, June the 6th, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, there's five easy steps to get your recording sounding like a major label release that you can hear on Spotify or the radio. That's what it's called. Now, if any of you are on an email list and were notified by email, there was actually a little link to that as well. So it's going to be with Bobby Alsinski. It's going to be a lot of fun. If you know Bobby, he's a great writer as well and has written some really definitive books, which are considered to be some of the best books on recording, and especially on acoustics out there. So check that out. That's June the 6th, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Please make a note of that. Okay. Um, so, how about this? It's a good one. This is one of Matt's suggestions. Guitar players everyone should know about. I suppose the way that I would say that is who are the guitar players that maybe, because I hear the word underrated a lot, who is somebody that you believe is, they can be famous but not talked about, they could be unknown, they could be anywhere in between. Give us and uh, tell us who are the guitar player or players that you believe that we should all know. This is a wonderful community, so let's help each other out. And this is to win the Phil Allen production course and the Phil Allen mix course. So who is who is somebody that you believe, male, female, you name it, that you believe is not doesn't get enough recognition? Paul Kossoff came up straight away. Oh, Rob, I'm not choosing. That's Matt's job. Zappa, great. Holdsworth, Peter Green, Phil Keggy. Uh, Starting off, you know, Paul Kossoff. Oh, ah, dude, it's, it's up to Matt to choose. But anyway, yeah. Kossoff with that kind of, you know. I must say, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, some of the best technically incredible guitar players, um, and some of them were super, super famous, they always lack one thing in their playing, especially jazz guys, especially jazz rock guys, is they are awful when it comes to bending and terrible with vibrato. And that's almost every single great jazz rock guitar player I know. They just don't get it. And when I say to them, do you like Paul Kossoff, and they say he's okay, I'm like, that's why you're not very good. Because <laughs> you listen to Kossoff. You know that solo? Oh, it's called, Do You Remember? In the Morning. You know, that song is freaking amazing. Oh, Hair Knox, thank you ever so much. You just bought me lunch. Thank you. La Workman, that's a good one. Jeff Beck. Oh, Paul, you're very kind. Ah, uh, Gerardo, you're very, very kind. Robert Fripp, there's a good one. McLaughlin. B.B. King. Rick Beato, Rick's a great guitar player. Gary Moore, great ones. Yeah. Malmsteen's vibrato is good. Uh, yeah, a lot of rock guys have really good vibrato, but yeah, they're good. Uh, Jason Becker was amazing. Uh, poor guy, incredible. Yeah, Kossoff on. Do you remember? Ba -da 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 -ba -ba -da 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 -ba 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 -da 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 oh, Nigel Dawson won something. Nicely picked. One of our uh, congratulations. Um, Nigel's been. Uh, that's really. That's right. Nigel has like been here since the beginning. Uh, nicely done. Uh, Dave Matthews, George Harrison. I mean, these are all great. Martin Offler, yeah. Um, Saturnani, Vi, Slash, Joe Walsh, Billy Gibbs, all fantastic. Brian May. Brian May has an amazing vibrato. Let me tell you my quick Brian May story. So I, when, I, when I got to meet Jeff Beck years and years ago, I got to spend a day with him, and I think I've told you guys on and off lots of stories about it, but there's like four or five hilarious things. But it was right at the end of the day. Um, it was like nighttime, about 10 o'clock at night, and I was about to about to leave and um, we're at the bottom of the stairs like at the door like talking guitars and 
we're just all we've been doing the whole time is talking guitars and guitar playing and the phone rings and he doesn't answer the phone he's, and Jeff's like oh, and he's got that spinal tap kind of you know he's from South London like a lot of my family and he's like oh, I'll just say that go to voicemail you know whatever no it wasn't voicemail I let the machine pick it up I think he said and he had this you know ring and then he had a and we carried on talking for like 20 minutes. We we're standing at the door talking about guitars and guitar playing and amplifiers and all the stuff you do. And then he says, no, I'm just going to go and check that message. And he goes back and he hears, beep. <laughs> Mind you, the phone hadn't rung all day. So obviously he doesn't give out his home number to many people. And he comes back up to the door and says, oh, oh, oh that, was, uh, that was Brian, Bri Brian May. <laughs> And I'm just like, I'm, at this point, I'm like completely white because I'm hanging with Jeff Beck and we've been jamming and swapping guitar riffs. And, you know, when I say swapping, that's humble, you know, believe me. Um, he was showing me a lot of stuff. But anyway, um, we just had this day together. And now he's like, the only time the phone's rang, it's Brian May. And I'm just, my world's exploding because, of course, I'm the biggest Queen fan. And he says to me, he goes, it's Brian, Brian May. Do, do you know Brian? And I was like, no, but I... I, I know his vibrato, and he, he just he just pauses and he looks at me and he goes, lovely, innit? And I just remember, what, what a great guitar player, geeky guitar player moment that you can just bond over the fact that Brian May has a wonderful vibrato, you know, it's just like that kind of stuff. Thank you ever so much for buying me lunch, senor, Mr. Hair Knox, or Her Knox, I don't want to mess it up. Um, really, really good. Anyway, Tim Pierce. Yes, you guys are very correct. Tim is one of the great guitar players. I think he's one of the he's the in the top five most recorded guitar players of all time. Um, okay, so um, what did I want to before we do the last giveaway? Let's talk about EQing. Let's talk about mixing guitars. One of the things with electric guitar, which gets ignored a lot, is the recording and I know that sounds really freaking obvious but we have two things that we have to talk about here we have to talk about like because there's a lot of like mixing this mixing that but a lot of the great stuff and if those of you in the Academy will notice this sometimes I give you stuff that needs a lot of work but there's quite a few songs where you pull it up and it sounds great you remember I was talking about the Rick Springfield album that came out a few months ago that I mixed and I, 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 it's uh, when I got, was given the rough, the, the rough mix, and I went up against a bunch of other mixers, and I, I won the won the mix the mix off, if you like. So that was really very gratifying. Um, but when I when I heard their rough, I was really blown away. The vocals sounded fantastic. The bass sounded great. The guitars were phenomenally well recorded. It was just the drums hadn't had any love in the mix. So when I did my first mix. I just got those drums absolutely slamming, but I kept the guitars almost as they were. I brightened them a little bit. I did some high passing for some of the low rumble to create some room for the bass guitar to breathe for all of the low end or any keyboards to breathe. And of course the kick to shine because high passing is essential. I know there's a lot of absolute crapola talked out there by people who have never mixed a, a good sounding record. That sounds really, really mean. I'm sorry, but no, you do need to high pass, you just need to understand how to use it. Um, and just because you can't hear it on small speakers doesn't mean you're not going to hear it in other environments. So it's really important. Uh, anyway, so, oh, and by the way, can you bring me the Focal, somebody? And so the, um, I want to talk about those quickly. Uh, yes, or, or you, you can just hand me them. Okay, they're really hard to get out of the box. Yeah, they're really hard to get out of the box. We'll talk about these in a second. Um, so, um, so with the, so basically when I mixed that, I brought the drums together, got them really, really slamming, the way that he wanted to hear them. Uh, who was that? Uh, just... Oh, sales, yeah. sales calls. Would you like to buy some solar panels for your studio? Um, probably one day. Um, anyway, so we, uh, so I just brought those guitars up, brightened them ever so slightly, rolled off, and high passed. And that they came to life. Ah, Mike Campbell, yes. So that is a re that's kind of a lesson for me. If you're rescuing, um, if you're rescuing your guitars a lot, 
that's a little bit of a difficult situation for me. I believe that really what you need to be doing is spending more time um, spending more time on the recording and capturing the way you want it to be. Now, um, you don't need to, Kevin. It's just I, I get hit by so much stuff. Um, and if you do, I will definitely favor it. I've just, it's just I'm, I'm obviously. Uh, but you don't need to. I try to pick out stuff here, but I'm obviously I'm talking about different things as we go. Um, I just appreciate when people do. The, so, um, the, so with me, um, I just want to make sure I cover all the points that are important here so everybody gets uh, you know, really good information. So for me, mixing should be with the guitars in particular because it's really difficult to completely rejuvenate. Um, uh, yeah, phone rings. It's Brian. Do you know Brian? Um, it's really difficult to rejuvenate a sound. Now, I did something recently with, um, Blue, well, a couple of years ago with Blue Coop, which is um, the Bouchard brothers from Blue Oyster Cult, with uh, Dennis Dunaway, the bass player from Alice Cooper. The band's called Blue Coop. And they sent me an album to mix, and there was some guitars that had a little bit of a hollowness to it, so probably some phasing issue, maybe with double miking. And I was able to use multiband compression to bring some of those lows back. But ultimately, um, if there's a lot of fix-it stuff to do, then I might, uh, I might go back to the, um, I might go back to the, um, the, the artist and the producer or the engineer and ask them to re-record. It really depends on that. But the, the thing is with, with electric guitars, I really feel like you need to get that sound you want as much upfront as possible. So that's where I think these days, because of the difficulty for some people, not all of us, depending on the situation, not being able to record, you know, a loud electric guitar. That's where I think virtual amps are starting to come in. And we're going to get massively into virtual stuff. Okay, later. Don't worry, it's coming. Um, so, uh, the, um, so the, so I wanted to talk about this. So this is what we were doing yesterday. We were giving this away yesterday. These are the clear professional Focal headphones. So what I'd like you to do uh, is check that out. Go see the video. Please put it up, Mr. Produce Like a Pro, Matt, who's in Canada, who's in Canada. Check it out. Um, these headphones were absolutely phenomenal. Uh, they are $1,699. Uh, they're actual uh, their actual cost price isn't that far off it we found about yesterday trying to buy some um, and they are absolutely phenomenal and the reason why I want to mention them is they actually do have a left and right side and when I initially put them on I put them around back to front and when you put them around the other way they're even more amazing so I don't really know how much more to say other than they are so good that when you flip them around they sound better better still you know what I mean absolutely phenomenal totally phenomenal just try to look at some of those uh, uh, trying to look at some of these uh, uh, comments here there's the headphone giveaway from yesterday so please check it out um, I should you want me not <laughs> keep the phone in there so they're sitting in there, but they keep the phone in here and come and get it out. It's like, just keep it in there. <laughs> then we won't have um, disturbing us all the time. Um, okay, so highly, highly, highly recommend these Focals. Uh, yes, it's very, very expensive, but they are very, very good. So, you know me, I'm all about bargains, but we can't, you know, for those that can afford it, I don't know if you guys heard, but Eric Valentine, when we did the interview, sold a lot of those Strauss speakers to people who want to know what Eric Valentine's using. So, anyway. I'm ready for the Queen movie. Busy day at the ranch. Oh, yes. So, anyway. Brian May calling again. I wish. Was it Brian May calling, Andrew? Apparently not. All right. The last giveaway. So, first of all, um, two things. Um, Matt, quite rightly so. Thank you, Matt, is uh, asking me to remind you that on June the 6th at 4 p.m. PST, we are doing a live webinar with Bobby Alsinski. 
and we're going to be talking about five easy steps to get your recording sounding like a major label release that you would hear on Spotify or the radio. And there's a lot of detail stuff because you know Bobby Bobby really talks a lot about uh, a huge amount of different things, room acoustics, uh, you know, speaker placement, as well as mixing techniques and everything. So that's going to be really fantastic. Um, so just want to reiterate. The headphone giveaway, enter it if you haven't already. They're phenomenal. They're not cheap. I wouldn't go out and I don't have that $1,700 spare to buy them at the moment. If I did, I'd buy them because it's tear jerkingly good. Phenomenal headphones. Don't get me wrong, I love the blues. They, those blue headphones for the price are phenomenal. Easily the best micro, uh, headphones I've heard for the price. The Focal is the next level. The Focal, and I think Blue would be happy to admit that, because the Focals are $1,700 headphones that you put on your head and just take you back to that moment when you first heard the song. And I got teary-eyed. I actually had to stop myself from bursting into tears because I thought you guys and girls would think I was faking it, so I didn't do it. Links to everything are in the description, according to Matt. See? Links to everything in the description. So check all this stuff out. All right, the last giveaway. Please, everybody, like and share. And we're going to do the last giveaway. Two courses by Mr. Phil Allen. Um, there's 376 people watching. Would you please like and share? Um, that would be absolutely phenomenal. And then let's have a look at... Let's have a look at potential questions. We've done best guitar player or favorite guitar player, guitar players we should know about. Hmm. That's a good one. What is the one plugin, the one plugin that you cannot do without? What is the one plugin that you cannot do without when it comes to mixing or recording, recording or mixing guitars? It can be electric or acoustic. What is the one that you feel like is like the 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 one that's going to really without it you don't think or more importantly not only without it but you think is the one that takes it to the next level what is that one plugin when you come to mix yes thank you justin we're all at 200,000 oh by the way next week is giveaway week we are doing so much so many giveaways to celebrate the 200,000 yeah eq which eq pool I see a Red 2 EQ by Focusrite, Amplitude, we love Amplitude, Waves, SSL, great, Bias, uh, that's what I mean, it could be an emulation, simulation, could be an EQ, could be a compressor, could be a tape emulation, it could be anything, what is it that you cannot do without, Abbey Road Compressor, Scarlet, um, CL3, Slate Bomber, Waves, TDR Nova, that comes up a lot, SSL E Channel, I agree with that, MV2, nicely done. Chips, 1073, yeah. Uh, Waves, Diesa, Logic Classic, L3, more Waves, more CL2s, UAD Fatso, uh, CLA 1176. The CLA 1176 is a really good plugin. Uh, Alexi says Logic Stock Compressor, very nice. Reaper EQ. Waze Abbey Road, REQ, very nice, me too. Um, some Reaper plugins, Waves SSLs again. MJUC, thank you, Tom. Shout out to MJUC. Avid EQ3. Depends on what you record. Eddie, can you give us an idea? You can be, everybody's entered for whatever they say, but uh, um, Echo Boy, good, yeah, good, good thinking. More Echo Boy, Tone Boosters, Guitar Rig. Overloud, five, five, I don't know that. Um, saturation, like Sans Amp, yes. Abbey Road, I end up using Sans Amp. Kramer Master Tape, yeah, those are good. CLA. T Rax, yeah, very well said. SSL Fab Filter. I like that. JCM 2000 is my only plugin. Coffee, nice answer. Simon Brooks. Simon, what did you say? What was your thing? More clang hounds, nice. Simon one, Simon, what did you what did you say? It's hard to find. Simon Brooks, Abbey Road compressor. Oh, I scrolled up and saw it. 
Very nice. Bark of Dog, yeah. SBL Transient Designer, that's actually really good, yeah. Wonderful. Sound Toys Decapitator, very nice, yep. Yeah. Even Tide Harmonizer. The Fader, that's nice. Mmm. Duende. I want to do some stuff with SSL. I don't know if you're ever watching. For a guy that lives in SSL world, uses the plugins, uses uh, an SSL console, I don't really have any relationship with anybody at SSL. I don't really have much of a relationship with anybody at Avid, and I sell them tons of Pro Tools. There is, uh, Ed, Ed's amazing over there. He's been so fantastically helpful to us. So, shout out to Ed at Avid. Thank you. Um, Kramer Tape, Melder, CLF. Only had 200 bucks to spend to buy a bass to record which one. Uh, I would buy a used Mexican jazz bass or Mexican P bass. Just buy a used one. I have a, I have a jazz bass. Between that and my PVT-40 and, of course, my brand new, absolutely gorgeous... I don't know if you can buy these used yet because they just reissued them. This. These were going for like 600 bucks. It's like a boutique base. It's a BB-1200. Broad base 1200. It is absolutely gorgeous. And it's super inexpensive, not two hundred dollars, but it's like six hundred bucks. It's made in Indonesia, but remember, Yamaha own all of their factories. They don't farm it out. Gorgeous, absolutely love it. Okay, everybody, you've been absolutely wonderful. I have to go. Because I have to go to Harmony. And great. Please like and share. Thank you ever so much. You've been an amazing audience. We're back on Tuesday. Um, it's going to be a double whammy. It's going to be a long day for me on Tuesday. Um, next week is all about giveaways. There's going to be a lot of giveaways. So we're going to have a very busy day on Saturday filming a lot of videos for next week. BB3000, yeah. Thank you ever so much, Michael. I appreciate it. Yes, the Yamaha's goes. Anybody have any experience with Focusrite ISA 428 preamps? Yes, I have. I love them, Kevin. Yeah. The 428s. Um, this is going to be my last question I answered just because Kevin, I know, was asked a few times. ISO 428. I'm just going to looking up at a picture to make sure it's the one that I know it is. Images. Um, give me one second. ISA, sorry. Yeah. So we use some of these. Believe it or not, we use this. Um, we use this in uh, in Boston when we were tracking. And um, actually, yeah, those ones there, Kevin. That was uh, Tom Hamilton's bass sound. We had those. We had them. They had these. Uh, the original ones when they were the 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 console size ones. And that was Tom Hamilton's bass setting. And the bottom end and the warmth out of this thing, and I don't think they were modded, was pretty massive. So, um, wow. $1,500 for four pre's. It's pretty darn amazing. Wow. So if you're asking because you're seeing them at a good price, um, yeah. Wow, there's somebody here on Reverb selling one for 1200 bucks. That's... Wow. Is that why you're asking? Because they're such a good deal? I have no affiliation. I, I do love reverb, don't get me wrong, but I'm not making any money out of this. Look at that, 1200 bucks. So maybe that's why you're asking, Kevin. They're phenomenal. Really good. Yeah, Tom Hamilton's bass sound. And it was so much low end. Really, really low. Really nice. All right. Thank you, everybody. You all rock. If you're not already Academy members, go to the Academy and try it out. It's pretty freaking awesome. Um, yes, if you've got, it, you've got issues at 3.5k at a telly, put a de-esser. Remember, it's just a multiband compressor at 3.5k and use a de-esser on it and get rid of that squealing. It's going to be really, really good. Thank you, Alexi. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Tony. Um, wow, if somebody's buying, if somebody's selling one, Kevin, for 750 euros, buy it. You're not going to get four better mic pre's for that price. Yeah, well, Audient make amazing stuff. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I'm glad you like the haircut. 
Um, and congratulations, everybody that won. We'll see you next week. It's giveaway week. Tomorrow is Fact Friday. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. You all rock. Please, before you go, like and share. Um, don't forget to check out Bobby Alsinski's um, thing. And this. Enter to win this. Enter to win this. These sound amazing. I cried. They're that good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. And I'll see you all again very, very soon. And we're nearly at 2,000, 200,000, courtesy of you all. Thank you.